the time. We invested, invested time praising you, declaring how great is our God. We have, Father, been stirred by the music, looking forward to the holy city where there will not, not be orphans or illness or AIDS or poverty or exploitation and abuse. That is what will make Jerusalem truly beautiful, Lord, the holy city where righteousness abides. And Father, as we transition into your word now, continue to stir us through your spirit and your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen, Lord. We've concluded a series just recently, last Sabbath, on the temptations of Christ that centered upon the word if. Satan trust, it, it challenged, tempted Christ with temptations regarding his trust in his God, uh, Father's providence. He tempted Christ to cross boundaries. He himself has said in the word of God. And the last temptation was about loyalty regarding worship. And all of those temptations were couched with the word if. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. But the initial battle between the enemy and Christ with this if was not limited to the wilderness. This challenge, this temptation, this confrontation that Christ experienced with that if, if you are the Son, followed him throughout his entire ministry. It followed him all the way up to the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 through 43, we read, And those who passed by blasphemed him, that's Christ, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. This battle, though it started face to face between the, the adversary and Christ, now Satan would take a back seat and use people, inspire people with words. But it wasn't just words that were being spoken. Humanity was expressing a, a tendency that is natural for us. Humanity wanted a Messiah that had no cross attached to him. The crowds did not want a Messiah hung on a cross. The same passage reads, Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will save him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The crowds did not want a Savior with a cross. And it's tragic. It's painful to see the reality that pastors, elders, deacons, church leaders also did not want a Savior with a cross. We want to see if he can save himself by coming down if he comes down from the cross, we will believe. But we refuse to believe in a Savior hanging on a cross. The last one, in Luke 23, 39, the very criminals hanging next to Christ, one of them said, if you are the Christ, save us, save yourself and us. Get down from this cross and get us down from this cross too. Christianity, Christianity confronts, biblical Christianity confronts every human being with what Christ was confronted throughout his whole ministry. We want a savior, yes. We want a king, yes. But one that carries a cross? No. One that carries a cross and has to die? No. John 1.29 and Revelation 13.8 reveal that it wasn't just at that point that Jesus understood his identity as the Messiah. When he came to, to earth, he understood, and that conviction 
protected him. It was his adherence to, and it is written, protected him from diverging on the path of what the Messiah should be, needed to be, in order to save humanity. John the Baptist looked at Christ, looked at the people and pointed at him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sins of the world. And Revelation 13.8 says that this Lamb was slain since when? This was not a last-minute plan. When God was forming Adam in a perfect environment, like John was telling us, teaching this morning in Sabbath school, God knew that as his, he was creating this being, he was going to have to die for him, for the entire race. God understood that in order to be a, the Savior, to be the Christ, to be our Messiah, our Redeemer, he could not bypass the cross. To save you and me, he could not save himself. And he chose eternal death so that we may have the opportunity to choose life. Easter usually focuses on this, on the destiny of the Christ. But Jesus would say things to his disciples, and we'll just read this in just a little bit. In Acts 8.32, the scriptures which he read, this is the eunuch who asked Philip, who is this talking about in Isaiah 53? The scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. This is speaking about Jesus understanding his mission, understanding the process through which he could bring life to every human being. You could not have life unless he would first experience death. Jesus was the greatest life teacher because his life showed us, shows us how real is his life. His life teaches us how to receive his life. And his life convicts us and empowers us to live his life. Jesus would tell his disciples openly, the only way to live, one must first die. I'm going to skip because I, I want to make this point, and I'll come back to this one. This is the point I want to make. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Before he could rise again, first he had to be what? Killed. Before he could have life, before he, before he could bring life, he had to experience death. The Bible says in all Gospels that whenever Jesus would tell them this, the disciples were left scratching their heads. What is he saying? We don't understand what he means. They could not comprehend or grasp the idea that the, the Messiah would have a cross to pass. But the interesting thing is that Jesus has said more than this. In Romans 8.36, Paul the, the Apostle says, As it is written, for your sake we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Acts 8.32 says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. But Romans 8.36 says, who is led as a sheep to the slaughter? We are. And most of Christianity this weekend will look at the cross of Christ, and that's a beautiful thing to do, but it's a limited thing to do. Because just as Jesus talked about the cross the Messiah had to experience, just as surely and just as clearly, Jesus proclaimed that his disciples also must bear their cross. The cross is not something that Jesus experienced so that we could have life. That death on the cross gives us a power not just to live, but to die. Before we have to experience spiritual life, there has to be an experience of a death to self. Paul here is saying, we are also counted as sheep for the slaughter. We also have a cross to bear. In that same passage, same sequence, Jesus just tells them, the Son of Man will be killed and will rise again. And Peter edits that last part out. What? 
the Son of Man must be killed. Then Peter took him aside and began to do what with Jesus? That's a gutsy thing to do, to rebuke Jesus. But when Jesus turned around and looked at him, at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter by saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. And I highlighted mindful because we will see that in just a bit. This is, this is the amazing revelation from the Word of God. That it reveals God's challenge in trying to help humanity understand how to live. Most people will extrapolate, will pull out of Jesus the ten best ways to be a leader. The, ten, the five principles of Jesus on how to be rich. Be careful with those sermons. Jesus did not come here to teach us how to be good, successful leaders and CEOs of corporations that will perish. Jesus did not come down to teach us how to be successful, successful financially. Jesus came to show us that in order to have life, one must first die. Without that cross, one will never experience newness of life. You are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And Jesus follows that immediately by saying, he said to them, Whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up whose cross? Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, what will happen to it? He will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, what would happen? He will save it. Here you have Christ speaking clearly to his disciples, and they are not getting it. And to a great degree, the Christian church still doesn't get it. We say, Jesus died so that I may live. Yes, that's true. But Jesus died to show me the way to life. And the way to life passes unequivocally, unavoidingly. It has to pass through a cross. I cannot experience spiritual life, genuine inner spiritual life, unless I first have experienced inner spiritual dying to myself. There has to be a crucifying of self. There is a cross for those that, that desire to follow Christ. I think all of us are here because inside of us, sincerely, we want to follow in the steps of Christ. But as Rob said, that cross provokes fear because by nature, the cross, if Jesus did not receive a band-aid after the cross, then he was fine. Jesus was buried. And if I must experience that cross, there will be a part of me that will have to die. And it is resisting, avoiding, circumventing, excusing, justifying, pulling myself away, excusing, and delaying that process that keeps me stuck for years. Christianity will look at the cross of Christ and will limit it to the cross of Christ. But just like his disciples, we will ignore our cross. And without that cross, there will never be spiritual life. Colossians 3, 1 through 5 is a powerful passage. It has a beautiful sequence. It's an intelligent sequence. Paul, Paul reasons with the Colossians, who, by the way, have been teaching this false theology that if, if your mouth, if you're lying, then, then 
take a whip and whip yourself. Punish your body to make your heart holy. That somehow your character could be transformed by punishing physically yourself, which made it into the Christian church later, by the way, unfortunately. But Paul was already confronting it, and he's going to throw a monkey wrench in their thought, in their thinking. What does it mean that a, a disciple must die? What does it mean that a disciple has a cross to bear and not just carry it around? Jesus did not just carry the cross around Jerusalem. He carried it and then was killed in it. And if he's going to call his disciples to carry a cross, it's not for them to just carry it around. It is so that we may die. But this death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. For those that have experienced this death, it is the best thing that has ever happened to a human being because it's only after this death that the Christian experiences genuine life. Paul says this, If, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, and remember Peter, Jesus says, you are not mindful of the things of God. If you've been raised, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you what? Died. Resurrection, death. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And if you turn to that passage, I couldn't fit the whole thing in the screen, but if you look at that passage in your Bibles, you will see that if you read the whole sequence, there's a new revelation that sticks out. The cross of Christ is the, is the, the lesson, the lived-out lesson on how a human can experience real life. But this business of dying to self, dying to parts of me that keep me dead, dying to things that keep me spiritually stagnant, spiritually superficial, spiritually fake, spiritually fake. You have the resurrection, you have the death, but Paul finishes with this. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Real quick, uh, get your grammar English ability up and running. You were raised, is that past, present, or future tense? Past. For you died. Is that past, present, or future tense? Put to death. Is that past, present, or future tense? Is that past, present, or future? Therefore, put to death. Is that something that should have happened, should be happening, or should happen? So is that past, present, or future? Is that present, ongoing? Is it present, nonstop? Paul says, yes, you've experienced the resurrection power in your life because you have died. But that experience of newness of life is not something that you can point to 1984 when you got baptized. It's not something that you can point to, to five years ago when you were a missionary. A disciple puts to death the members of sin how often? Today. Even on Sabbath? Surely on Sabbath we don't have to die. We're all nice on Sabbath, right? When we get to church. <laughs> Therefore put to death your members. And see, this is what I told you. Paul threw a monkey wrench because the Colossians... We're expecting Paul to give them a new whip or a new stick so that they could really beat themselves into holiness. So Paul says, yeah, you want to beat something up? Beat up uncleanliness, passion, fornication, and desire. How do I hit that? How do I kill what I cannot reach? How does one experience death to self? Because these are phrases that some other Christians also have, but they're very common within Adventism. We must die to self. Amen. How? We stay with the abstract, but we never explore the scriptures and say, Lord, I want to experience this. 
I want to experience genuine spiritual life. And your word through Christ teaches me that in order for Christ to experience that life, that incorruptible life, he died. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you cannot skip it. You cannot say, I'll look at the cross from, a, from afar. I, if I'm going to be a disciple of Christ, I too must go through this process of dying to self so that I may experience genuine, joyful, powerful, righteous, holy life. There is no other way. How do we experience this? How do we put to death? How do we put to death these things that we cannot reach? Romans 8.13 says this. For if you live according to the flesh, what will happen? You see this now? Paul is really building up on the, what the things that Jesus was teaching his disciples, and now he's flipping it around even more. He's making it more clear. Jesus says, you want to save your life? You lose it. But if you lose it for my sake and the gospels, you'll keep it. Paul says the same thing, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by what? The spirit you put to death, the deeds of the body, what will happen to you? So how do we put to death? We have a clue here. Who puts to death? Who puts to death according to, to Paul in Romans 8.13? Who, who puts to death the deeds of the flesh? But if by the spirit... Who puts to death? Ah. The cross is not something that you are forced to go through. It is a choice. It is a choice. And this weekend, many Christians will look at Jesus on the cross and say, thank you for dying for me on the cross. Jesus will say, it's your turn. Not to atone for your sins, but so that my death can have an effect on your life. Because the death of Christ can only be experienced to those disciples that take up their cross and die as well. Not to atone for themselves, but to experience the atonement. To experience the power of the gospel. You see, John Little asked the question when he was finishing the Sabbath school class, how do we know Jesus has resurrected from the dead? There's an empty tomb. Which one? There's a lot. Jesus was smart. He didn't say, this is the one that I resurrected from, because you know what we would do to that tomb? I touched Jesus' tomb. I'm holier now. We're so bent on idolatry. So Jesus has not left us tangible, physical, geographical evidence that he is not in the grave, and I'm glad for that. I mean, just look at the Shroud of Turin and what it did for centuries. Took the eyes off of Christ and put it on a piece of cloth. But how do we know Jesus rose from the grave? When I experience my life being transformed from the inside out. When there's a power from outside of me changing me. Not just giving me new life, but causing those things inside of me. Covetousness. Lust, violence, the things that destroy homes, the things that destroy churches, the things that destroy society, those things, by the Spirit, die. And through that death, a new life comes up. Praise the Lord for this. Praise the Lord that I, I, we are invited to join in file, in rank, all of the disciples that, like Paul said, how often did he die? Daily. But come on, church, did you read in the book of Acts what Paul would do? He would heal people, he would cast out demons. People would take pieces of aprons that he would touch, and he would have sick people touch it, and because of the faith in the Jesus that Paul preached, they were healed. And Paul needed to die daily? Let's put it another way. If this Paul that did those mighty powerful works in the name of Christ, if he said he needed to die daily, how about me? How about you? See, only a Pharisee, 
Only a self-righteous, deluded Pharisee would say, I don't need to die. I just need to have a little splinter. I'm not that bad. I just need a Band-Aid over my heart, Jesus. Thank you. Just a little hydrogen peroxide, maybe some rubbing alcohol, and I'll be good to go. That's the attitude of the Pharisees with Christ. That's why you see chief priests, chief religious leaders that daily would be involved in the sacrifice of the Lamb, reject the Christ on the cross. They could not, they could not accept, conceive the idea that their Savior would be hanging on a cross because if that was true, then his disciples must also take up their cross and die. Die to their inward sins. Anyone can modify outward behavior, but only the power of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ can create newness of life inside. Galatians 2.20. Paul emphatically concludes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. Who lives in me now? Christ. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the cross right there. Jesus died. I die too. Jesus lives, I live too. Because I am crucified, I now live. Want to experience this in your life? Have you experienced this in your life? Have you experienced the power of God transforming your thoughts, your intentions, the motives by which you do things? Has your heart come alive and now you're beginning to discern that the good things you thought you did were not so good after all? I remember when God confronted me, I was 2019, almost 20, preached my first sermon in New Jersey. I was invited to preach to a church in New Jersey. They did not know me, otherwise they wouldn't have invited me. I put this sermon called, um, I'm not going to tell you. Anyways, after I preached it, all the saints came, and you know what they said to me? I wish my son was like you. You're so spiritual. Oh, you're, you're, I love the fact that you're giving your life to Jesus in your young years. Oh, that was a good sermon. That was good, 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 good. I should have said, get behind me, Satan. I thought I was doing God a favor. By preaching a sermon. And in my sick, unconverted mind, I thought, well, since I've done this extra stuff for Jesus by preaching, after Sabbath today, I have some credits to sin. Have you ever thought like that? You give a little extra in the offering plate, you teach Sabbath school, you play me song, now you have credits to do a little bit in the world. Those are clear evidences clear evidences, there is no spiritual life within, even if I'm preaching a sermon or singing a song or teaching a lesson. Isn't that scary that we could be going through emotions while being dead inside, dead in trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2, 1 says, faking it. How does that person do it? They do it like this. I'm going to do it like that too because they seem to be spiritual because I want to be spiritual only on the outside because to do it on the inside, I must die. I must die. I'm going to tell you one last story. Many of you already know and we'll make it more acquainted to you. And You must realize I only have one life and from that life I, I draw a lot of experiences that have helped me understand spiritual things. And because for 26 years I was without a green card, a lot of lessons came from th those years. I had to experience this death to life. One of my, my most vulnerable ports, parts of life. In 92, I graduated high school. 
It, it looked like soon our green cards were going to come. So I thought, I'll wait for two years. I'll go to college. I'll pay myself. 94 is when the, my green card went bust. My parents got theirs. My younger brother got his. And they moved on. And when that happened, my world got really small all of a sudden. Because you see, when you're in high school, if you wear nice sneakers and good clothing, then you're cool, even if you have no hobbies and you got bad grades. But once you graduate high school, a radical change happens. All the cool guys with a cool haircut that never went to class, and all the geeky nerds that got straight A's and never skipped class, they go off to college and careers and jobs. And I saw that. All of a sudden, we're graduating, and all the, the cool guys are nervous. Man, I ain't getting no more free lunches no more. What am, I, what am I going to do? I'm glad I was a geeky nerd. Went to college. Then the green card thing happens. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, at least I had a job, and I got it when I was in high school. And even though I was an illegal immigrant, uh, they hired me. They needed people. And... I went to become assistant manager, and I was doing payrolls, and I was doing all sorts of managerial things, thinking, wow, you know, this, maybe I can make a career out of this. If I don't get a green card, at least I'll be an illegal professional. <laughs> and you know what the thing is? My, my superiors knew. And they trusted me, because they knew that I needed this job. See, illegal immigrants value jobs. They don't just are flipping about it and call off sick whenever they just want to watch a TV show. We value our work, and I think my, job, my manager, who was from California, knew that. So he protected me. And then I, he, he left, and a, and a Puerto Rican named Sam Rodriguez came, and he was a Jehovah Witness. He understood what it was persecute, to be persecuted for your beliefs. They don't do blood transfusions and all these things. He protected me, too. I mean, Black Friday, working at a retail clothing store on Black Friday, it was mandatory. That weekend, you were there or you were out. And I did not work one Sabbath all those years. God sent a Jehovah Witness to protect my Sabbath. Isn't that beautiful how God works? So when Jehovah Witnesses come and knock on my door, I don't make fun of them, I don't insult them, and I don't make fun of them in other people's circles. Because God used one of them so that I could keep Sabbath. But then in 1994, we got, I didn't get my green card. In 95, my comp the company that I work with went bankrupt. And I didn't realize that for the past six years, my my world had become this mall. The Harrisburg East Mall was my universe. All my friends were there. On my days off, I would go to the mall. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Why are you taking your lunch break? I want to hang out with you. Kind of pathetic and a loser, isn't it? Maybe not. I don't know. Um, it was like church. It was like my church. So my company goes bankrupt. I'm without a job, and now I am illegal. And I'm really shaking my fist at God. Then I meet a young lady. She was a U.S. citizen who we were dating. and ended up working with her family. They were paying me five bucks under the table. I thought, I got it made. Cash every day. I don't have to pay taxes. What a sick thing to say. And I get to work with a person I date. So we, we dated for some years, and I eventually I thought, hey, She's a U.S. citizen, and not that I'm doing it for that reason, but if I marry her, I get my green card. And she, she's, she, she knew that we, you know, it was a legit relationship. I wasn't just going to marry her and then dump her when I got my green card. But she did not believe in God. She had no spiritual upbringing. But in my mind, God had left me hanging. And so I thought, since you're not helping me, I'm going to take my destiny into my own hands. So I said, we're going to get married. She said, okay, we'll go back to the state that I live in. We'll start our own business together. I thought, great. She went first to kind of get the ground set up so that we could start our own business. And I was going to stay and kind of finish tying up some loose ends in Harrisburg. I was sitting in my bed after a day of work and I couldn't lay down in my bed. I wouldn't put my headphones on because that's how I would stay away from God, through music. I would blare music to my brain till I fell asleep.
because I knew if I gave God an inch of silence, he was going to talk to me. So that night I didn't put on my headphones and I just sat in my bed and have you ever had an emotion in you that you can't really put your finger on it, what it is? It's like you smell something, you're like, what is that? I've smelled that before. And not that it smells bad. It's just it's evoking memories and you're not sure what it is. And the emotion that came inside of me that I couldn't quite figure out what it was that I was feeling, I know what it feels like. It felt like when my best friend, Carlos Maldonado, left. He was such a spiritual influence in my life. And, and I said goodbye to him. It feels like when I say goodbye to my brother, my lifelong friend, my buddy, the guy that we went through so many experiences, he really knows me. And when Marcelo went to AUC to Massachusetts, I, he was no longer in the house. And I remember feeling so sad when I saw his car drive away in the highway. But why am I feeling sad? Who am I saying goodbye to? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God said, you're going to say goodbye to God? If you marry this young lady, your spiritual life will never be what it could be through this marriage. If you marry her, you're saying goodbye to me. You mean you're asking me to break up with my solution? You're asking me to let go of my only ticket to the green card and a life? Are you crazy? If you marry her, you lose me. And I started sobbing. And I started sobbing because it was true. And that night, I had to make a choice. And that night, as crazy as it seemed to my mind, the idea was accepted. I need to break up with her. I need to die. There is something in my life that has to die. This relationship needs to die so that I may live. And it was painful because it wasn't just the relationship that was ending. I was killing the opportunity for a life, for a green card, for U.S. citizenship, for freedom. Freedom to do what I wanted. Freedom to live as I wanted. And then Jesus, the Spirit of God is so tender with us. Ariel, you know that friend of yours that's a loser? Yeah. Yeah. He is a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizenship doesn't stop you being a loser. It just makes it worse. <laughs> you know sister so-and-so? Yeah? She has a green card. She is miserable. You, as an illegal immigrant, had had to encourage her at times. Why hasn't her green card encouraged her? Ariel? You want to live, something in your life has to die if you want to follow me. If you want to follow me, there is something holding you back. There is something holding you back from experiencing genuine, inward, peaceful, restful life. You are dead in trespasses and sins. Sin controls you. Sin is, enslaves you. Sin fills you with fear, distorts your view of reality. Without me, without me, you will not live. I called. I hung up the phone. The relationship was over. A few months later, I was on a plane to California, completely out of the blue, to learn massage. From California to South Dakota to learn evangelism. From South Dakota to Ohio to church plant, a church where I would meet my wife. From Ohio to Pennsylvania to learn nursing. And nursing to Andrews to get my master's. And from Andrews to Oakwood to preach you this sermon. 
that you cannot live unless you die. What has the Spirit of God been striving with you for so long that needs to go in your life? What in your life has God's Word been confronting you needs to die so that you may live? I die daily. Your pastor needs death daily. Your pastor is crucified. But the life that I live and the blessings you receive, they're not from me. It's Jesus Christ living in me that pours his blessing on you. Do you want to be crucified with Christ? Are you willing to put to death the things that are keeping you and holding you back? Who wants to make a decision this morning to die? Who wants to make a decision this morning to be a disciple of Jesus that is willing to take up that cross and sacrifice and die? Who is willing to not resist but yield? If the Spirit of God is convicting you, if you have this desire, please come forward. We're going to pray together. If there's something in your life that needs to be surrendered, if there's something in your life that God has been pointing at that terrifies you, that you think you're going to have financial loss, that you think you're going to lose a relationship, that you think is going to hurt you more than it was going to be worth it, I want to invite you to come forward. No one needs to know what it is, and I'm speaking as general as I can. But my friend, it's in vain to talk about the cross of Christ if we're not willing to talk about the cross that I need to bear too. Something in me needs to die that I might live. Something in your life right now The Spirit of God is probably convicting you, has to die. Something is holding you back. Is it hurt? Is it pride? Is it career? Is it reputation? If the Spirit of God is convicting you, will you not take up that cross and allow Christ to give you life by allowing that which brings suffering and death to your life to cease to be. As I was preparing the sermon, I thought, I tried to use my imagination. If that night that the Spirit of God pointed to me and said, there's something that has to die, where would I be if I would have said no? I shuddered, the hairs in my arms stood up, I couldn't think of the misery, the sadness, and the emptiness that would be my life reality because I would have walked away from God. Lord, I'm glad that you see hearts, I'm glad that you see hearts. I know many are sitting, terrified to come up. What will they say? I've been there. And though I would not move, your spirit would move me. So I want to take time, Lord, not to pray first for those that have come forward, but for those, Lord, who know they need to and are terrified. See their hearts, Lord. See their hearts. Convict, Lord. Convict. Follow us. Do not let us lose out on the opportunity to experience real life, the life of Christ in us. Please, Lord, look at the hearts. Look at the hearts 
of those who are sitting. Father, I want to pray for my friends that have stood up. No one needs to know. I'm glad you see the heart. Whatever needs to die, give us of the Holy Spirit that through the Spirit and your Word, we can choose, Father, to walk away, painful it may be, to trust that after the cross comes life. Lord, sealing us this choice, sealing us this decision, because you know our hearts and you know our battle. In the name of Christ, Lord, give us victory. Give us victory over what we need to surrender. We don't want fake superficial. We want sincere, genuine, inward, spiritual life in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen, Lord. Amen.